thank you very sincerely for the opportunity uh, to come speak with you. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor. So the title of the talk is A Glimpse of the Future, Insights into Water Resources in a Warmer Northwest Territories. Oh, and I want to just uh, acknowledge some of my um, major uh, research collaborators who, are, who contributed to this project, Jen Baltzer, who's right here, uh, Aaron Berg and Oliver Sonatag, and Masaki Hayashi, who are, who are not here, but are here in spirit. Okay, um, now Laurier researchers have been working in the NWT for many, many years, um, but we really reached a milestone in 2010 when we signed the uh, Wilfrid Laurier Government of Northwest Territories Partnership Agreement. Um, that um, agreement really increased our capacity to conduct research in water resources and in ecosystem studies and related studies as well um, throughout the territory. It's, uh, it, it also led to the development of a new state of art research facility on the Laurier campus. If you squint and look very hard, you'll see uh, proudly flying in the wind is the NWT um, um, flag. Um, but perhaps even more importantly is it's increased our capacity to conduct field studies throughout the territory at a number of sites um, shown here. And in many of these sites, the Laurier, well, sort of, many of them are sort of Laurier sites or they're led by Laurier researchers. researchers. So my uh, discussion tonight. We'll focus in on Scotty Creek down here near Fort Simpson. Phil will then talk about his work at the northern end of the Taiga Plains. Okay, so Scotty Creek, where is it? It's, I said it's 50 kilometers or so south of Fort Simpson. It's actually one of a cluster of uh, um, study basins that include the Jean Marie, Birch, and Blackstone Rivers, all of which are gauged by Water Survey of Canada. This is a region of um, discontinuous permafrost. It's in, the, um, it's in a wetland dominated zone. Scotty Creek's about <clears throat> 150 square kilometers in area. And just to take you down a little closer to the ground, we started work there back in oh, 1999-ish. And at that time, we were very much focused just on hydrology, looking at you know, trying to figure out how this landscape that you might know as muskeg, how it handles runoff, how it stores water, sheds water, that kind of thing. And one of the things that jumped out at us pretty early on is that le different um, land cover types have their own sort of function in the overall cycling and storage of, of water in the basin. So really we can break things down in, in this way. We have the permafrost areas, which are the uh, yellow areas. Those are also the areas that, um, where the trees are, the black spruce. They, because they're underlain by permafrost, it bumps up the ground a little bit, and that means really they, they're sort of like the hill slopes of the region. Um, so water sheds off these. These are runoff producing areas. Then we have these channel fens where they're like the rough channels, stream channels, so they convey water to the basin outlet. Then you have what's left over, um, except for the lakes, you have different types of bogs and bogs store water. Okay, so that was the beginning of our conceptual model. You have three major peatland types and they all do different things, right? That's how we approach this for quite some time. And, and this is, um, really again getting a little closer to the ground surface, a cross section of a sort of an idealized peak plateau. Here's our permafrost that underlies the plateau. It, it uh, causes the ground to rise up one to two meters above the surrounding wetlands. Because you have this hydraulic gradient, water shed off the surfaces of the pl plateaus and through the soils into bogs like here and, and there. And, and as I mentioned, what do bogs do? They store water, so water just sits there and it evaporates maybe interacts with groundwater, or it can go off into um, a channel fen, and here's an example of a channel fen, and water entering fens slowly makes its way to the basin outlet. Now, about five or so years into the study, we just couldn't help but notice the land cover where we had set up our study sites was dramatically changing. 
and it was changing most abruptly at these borders where the <coughs> permafrost is. So if I can just draw your attention to this, this uh, example of a border between permafrost and non-permafrost. So here, here, here we go, this is a border or an edge, okay, permafrost and trees on one side, no permafrost, no trees on the other. What's happening is these edges we noticed were moving in at an, at an alarming rate, like a rate of maybe over a meter a year caused a sort of a practical problem, right? We had to lift up our tents and move them in into higher, drier ground on a regular basis. And then we thought we were just trampling and causing local disturbances, but we, we soon uh, saw it was more widespread. Just an example, here's our colleague Masaki. He's standing next to some equipment here in the, in the field. And behind him is the edge, that edge I, I showed you here. Um, so no forest or permafrost behind that little yellow circle, but <coughs> he's standing on permafrost, excuse me. And um, well, let's go forward eight years, and that edge had moved up 10 meters to where he was standing. So 10 meter horizontal migration, and, and our, our geophysical work um, showed that the thickness of that permafrost is also about 10 meters thick, right? So it's a heck of a lot of permafrost to lose over an eight-year eight period. It's relatively warm, it's primed, it's ready to go. A bit of disturbance on that unsaturated layer, which um, serves as a, uh, a, a critical function to thermally insulate permafrost. You trample that, disturb it, and off it goes. You start this feedback mechanism whereby you have a very high rate of, of thaw indeed. Now, just to give you um, an example of how things would, are changing, um, this is a cross-section of a plateau in 1999, 42 meters uh, across, and as we went down 2008, down to 26 meters, so horizontal shrinkage. Um, what this doesn't show is it doesn't give you a sense of the, the vertical settling, right? This ice cube, if I can put it that way, is thawing, melting on all sides. And that means that this forest is having to subside. And of course, being black spruce doesn't like uh, water. And that means that that's where our land cover change comes in, right? Because our forest turns to, to wetland. And here's a sort of a more complete picture of this, this cross section here. So starting out 40-ish meters across. Uh, last I measured, this, in this case, we're about 17 or 18 meters across last fall. And um, with regard to the vertical thaw, uh, this line here, which is reference to the axis, the vertical axis on the right, uh, shows that, well, okay, what, what is this? This is the average um, thaw depth at the end of the summer. Okay, so it's, I don't know, there's, I think they're 50 centimeter points. So you go across and you make an average and you plot that point. Well, by Mid-decade, you know, before mid-decade, up till about 2004 or five, the average end of summer thaw depth was around 60 centimeters. But then at around that time, mid-decade, it starts to creep up. And now we're at a point where each uh, summer, the um, thaw depth is well over a meter by the end of, by the, end of the summer. Okay, so this caused us to, to, to pause. Um, we had our conceptual model. We were just a couple of hydrologists in the field. There's a lot more going on than we realized. Go back and look at some of the archive data. Okay, so temperatures way back 1896 to the present. Um, and yeah, there's an increase in temperature, particularly over the last part of the 20th century. Precipitation is also increasing and a little bit more detailed look at that precipitation record indicates that uh, particularly snow um, falls are, are, or end of winter snow accumulation is, has increased in recent years. But what really inter interested us was the uh, aerial photograph archive. Because, and the reason is because of that correspondence between the, the tree cover, the black spruce tree cover, and permafrost cover. Now I want to emphasize that's not the case in all forests, but in this part of the Northwest Territories, the southern part of the Taiga Plains, black spruce generally indicates permafrost. Okay. Um, so what are we looking at here? We're, we're, we've taken a number of photographs of this, I think it's about a one square or a half a square kilometer, and we've indicated where the trees and permafrost, right, same thing, 
where the trees and permafrost coverage was back in the mid 20th century, so 1947, based on aerial photographs. Um, there's another year in there which uses another shade of blue, 1970. But you can see how your permafrost has receded, particularly in certain areas. Now, um, remember that um, it's not, you know, who, ca who cares what one bog turns into something else. They have different hydrological functions. That's what we developed with that conceptual model. So if I can just draw your attention to this area here, which was formerly, right up until the early 70s, a bog, right? And then um, you lose this amount of permafrost in here, and now, well, it's not a bog anymore. <laughs> it's, a, it's a channel fen. It's part of this channel fen sequence, and it's rather than storing water, it can now participate in uh, basin runoff, uh, basin uh, conveyance of water down, downstream to the outlet. So here's a more complete picture. Uh, four or five years, 1947 to 2008. You may have seen this before. It's one of my favorites, so I keep showing it. Um, <clears throat> so um, green is permafrost and, and forest. And uh, really, we're looking at, over that period, 47 to 2008, a decrease in both forest and permafrost from 70% to 43%. Or you can look at it the other way, in, in an increase in the wetland permafrost-free coverage, right? Really, we're clearing out the trees and we're, uh, you know, pollutification as the term is, I, I believe, for wetland scientists. I think that wetland expansion, right? Okay, remember those basins that I started off referring to, I, I've been talking about Scotty Creek, but I want to go back to those other basins now, Birch, Blackstone, Jean Marie. Some work that we did early, early on this, in, this, in our research, um, we took, well, I think there are four-year averages of runoff for each of those basins. Then we did some remote sensing analysis to find out, you know, our thinking was that these different train types do different things hydrologically, so we we uh, defined the percentage bog, percentage cover for those uh, four, ba four basins and used that to estimate what would happen to any one basin if you lost permafrost and you got more channel fen or more bog or whatever. And so there's, there's different relationships, but I want to show that there's quite a strong positive relationship for um, channel fens, right? So what's happening? Those Plateau bog complexes are thawing out. The bogs inside there, the little isolated bogs are starting to connect. They're growing into one another, or they're just being breached by the advancing uh, fen. And so fen area is growing, and you're, as a result, you, you would be getting a greater proportion of the basin contributing runoff. So we go back and look at the hydrometric record for the lower Liard Valley, those same four basins, and this is what's um, happening, right? So our about mid-1990s, our four basins start increasing their runoff. Now, if it was just one of those basins, it wouldn't be so compelling, but the fact that all four are in steadily increasing their runoff is, um, I believe, um, significant. Now, and, and also, it's, it's happening in the absence of appreciable increases in precipitation. Our statistical analysis suggests that about the increase in precipitation can only account for about a third, about 30% of the increase in, in, um, in runoff. Um, so, looking at other possible sources, groundwater, well, that contributes maybe, oh geez, less than I think it's less than 5% of, of uh, winter base flow. I should say winter base flow is about 5% of the total annual flow. So it seems that groundwater is not a major contributor. And another thing that we can um, uh, safely uh, look away from is, is the, the uh, direct translation of the ice in the thawing permafrost to runoff. It doesn't make a major con contribution. You hear people talking about increases in um, runoff caused by permafrost thaw. What's a much more plausible explanation is not the direct impact of water released from thawing permafrost, but the permafrost thaw induced land cover change, which changes the um, bogs, for example, areas that store, but bog, right, stores water. You breach the permafrost that's ca containing water in that bog, psh, opens up, and now your bog is a channel fen, and uh, again, an example of 
how your landscape is partitioning um, uh, input into storage or runoff dif differently. Now, this caused us to go back and re-evaluate our conceptual model. It's not really that simple. Um, we have permafrost thaw going on at the edges of plateaus, but also between bogs. These areas that we thought were just storing water have actually developed flow connections that are sort of seasonally, uh, um, you know, ephemerally, ephemerally, I should say. They start, stop, start, stop. When they're all connected, you can have a bog series connecting and behaving like a cascade, right? And again, that means that our uh, plateaus are able to produce runoff through the bogs, which when, when before we thought that wasn't, that wasn't uh, occurring. And here, this photograph just shows you an example of one of these flow connections. You can see sort of classic drunken forest. Uh, I apologize, it's a bit distant, but um, really these are, uh, at certain times of the year, these bogs will connect and then one's kind of like this fill and spill mechanism. Um, one bog flowing into the other and ultimately into the channel fan. That has uh, runoff Im implications. So, based on our observations so far, we can say, you know, we ask ourselves, well, how do these new bogs form? How does permafrost thaws initiate? How do these flow connections, how do they just appear when, when uh, they weren't there before? How does that happen because uh, you know if we have this sort of fundamental understanding we can put ourselves in a better position to predict um, future patterns and, and rates of permafrost thaw. So this is how we see it. Um, we can have a thinning of the canopy for whatever of a reason, disease, fire perhaps, and that allows more radiation to arrive at the ground surface which ultimately means more energy going into the ground which causes a thaw depression. Water is drawn toward that depression because you have a hydraulic gradient now and that wets up the soil, which makes it more thermally conductive, and you know, this, this leads on to deeper thaw depression, water is drawn in from a greater area, and pretty soon you punch a hole through that relatively thin, relatively warm, discontinuous permafrost. Right? So that could be a new bog, or it could be a flow, uh, one of these connection areas that uh, occurs between bogs. Now, admittedly, that's sort of a rather simple um, se sequence of events. There's all kinds of other things that can, can happen there. Uh, l lots of other linkages, feedbacks, all kinds of other implications of, of permafrost thaw to, to think about. And this is when Misaki and I came together and said, look, this is way more complicated than we signed up for. We've got to get some, some more expertise in. This is where we brought in ecologists like, like Jen and um, Oliver and Aaron and others who I referred to earlier. And they've started to do a lot of this direct research on a lot of the linkages and feedbacks and, and couplings that uh, refer, to, refer to here. Um, and I'll just summarize some of that. So for example, Oliver is looking at um, how would this landscape um, um, respond in terms of evap evapotranspiration. So, you know, based on his flux tower um, measurements. I mean, you can just see the photograph is taken from the top of his flux tower. We can expect more evapotranspiration. Um, he's also a lot of work being done on uh, carbon cycling. And although this is not a very strong relationship and the, air, bar, the um, air bars are sort of overlapping in some places, um, there does seem to be evidence that there will be greater CO2 uptake in the future in this uh, landscape which is uh, contains less permafrost, less trees, and more bog, and more wetland, I should say. CH4, methane, more potent greenhouse gas, we can expect, um, more, more confidently expect, based on th these results, that we'd have uh, a greater um, flux to the atmosphere. Now, um, not only did we bring in more expertise to look at Scotty Creek, but we we're also looking farther afield, and this is, um, um, this sort of thinking produced, you know, we realized that Scotty Creek's down here. Geez, you know, the Taiga Plains has, is a sort of nicely oriented, right, north-south kind of narrow uh, um, uh, um, eco-region with, um, it's nicely set up with different bands of permafrost concentration and, um, and uh, different gradients of, of moisture and so on, vegetation. So why don't we see what else is happening? Is this process happening further north, for example? 
So that's resulted in bringing in more expertise. Um, I think the Taiga Plains Research Network has something like 15 researchers now. So it's no longer just a hydrology show by any stretch. So lots of people working on the ground, but also we have people that are interested in looking at the Taiga Plains. Again, this is Taiga Plains uh, from above. Um, in fact, above is the name of the uh, NASA's uh, Arctic Boreal Vul Vulnerability Experiment. So coupling and complementing our ground-based studies from remote sensing studies. So I've probably talked too, too long here, so let me just quickly summarize. Um, so um, in a nutshell, permafrost thaw can, can also mean land cover change. And I stress this is what's happening in the southern Taiga Plains, but it's, it's not that simple. If it were, we wouldn't jump into this Taiga Plains network and, and see what, it, what, what other permafrost thaw processes are happening <coughs> in other parts of the uh, uh, subarctic and boreal. Land cover change can also mean changes to water resources, water quality and quantity. I didn't get into qu qu quality, um, but there are some interesting uh, findings emerging there. Um, we need more research to understand and predict these ecosystem feedbacks. I think the devil is in the details of the feedbacks and, and linkages. Um, so more work required there and more research also needed on these large scale impacts um, going over the larger region, seeing how things are, are changing there as well. So with that, Phil, I, I'll uh, conclude. I hope I didn't go on too long. So thanks, Bill. And what I want to do now is move to a fairly different environment, so under the northern Mackenzie, a lot colder, continuous permafrost, but really follow up on two of the themes Bill was talking about. One is it, the climate is changing, it will continue to change. And the question is, what impact is that going to have in this kind of environment? And I also play up, as Bill did, that these are very complex systems. When we started working in these areas, we thought the answers might be relatively simple. Turns out they're quite complex. So I'm going to give you three examples of studies we've done over the last decade or so, um, where we're looking at the impact of a changing climate on the water resources of the area, and show you that we end up, in all cases, with much more complex answers than we expected, and in some cases, big surprises, and the answers were completely different than we might have expected. So just to start, though, just to remind you why we're in the problem we are. Uh, so this is carbon dioxide concentrations in the Earth's atmosphere over the last 800,000 years from a variety of different sources. Remembering that CO2 is a potent greenhouse gas and its impact on climate has been known for over 100 years. So a Swedish scientist who did the first um, predictions of what either having or doubling CO2 concentration in the atmosphere was. If you look at his 1906 paper, which looked at doubling of CO2, his answer was one and a half to three degrees C, which is actually exactly the same as sophisticated climate models give us. Um, the difference, though, we might all go, well, we're obviously wasting our time. Um, so just back up. So this, you can see that over the last 800,000 years, the atmospheric CO2 was never greater than 300 ppm. And since industrialization, it's increased rapidly. We're now over 400 parts per million and increasing quickly. So the long-term effects of doubling CO2 have been well known for 100 years. What's difficult and unknown and from an atmospheric science point of view, people are still working on, but there's been tremendous advances, is on two things. One, what's the distribution of changes in air temperatures? So this map, we're looking down at the North Pole, um, North America, the study area that we're talking about is in this area. The darker the red, the warmer it's going to be over the next 50 years. Um, in the areas of the northern Mackenzie, whatever temperature that is, three, four, five degrees warmer in the winter than it is currently. And if you look at the time, the, or the change in temperature and precipitation over the next century, so the black line in each case is past. The colored lines are our predictions or scenarios of what's going to happen in the future with different carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas scenarios. So the interesting thing is, if you look at winter and summer, it's warmed more to date in the winter than the summer. Precipitation has been generally increasing as well. And if you look at the predictions of what's going to happen in the future under different scenarios, you see that over the next 20 to 30 years, it actually doesn't matter. Whatever we do 
to our CO2 emissions at the moment won't actually impact. So this warming in the summer and the winter over the next 34 years is actually built into the climate system at the moment. So all we're doing now, so we're, this warming is going to happen no matter what we do. The changes in CO2 emissions we make now are actually going to de determine whether going on this tra tra trajectory with a 10 degree uh, warming over the next century or maybe keeping it within a couple of degrees C, which is what scientists are suggesting is the maximum we can allow and still control, have some control over the future climate. If we allow the climate to go to this trajectory, we actually completely, because of the feedback processes, some of them that Bill talked about, we actually lose control of any future changes. So we want to try to keep it to this blue line. So Bill talked about some sites down here, so I'm going to talk about some studies we've done in the Mackenzie Delta region over the last 20 or 30 years and look at two very different environments. So the upland watersheds to the east of the Mackenzie Delta that look something like this, mostly tundra, but shrubs and some tree patches as well. And we'll also I'll show you one example from some Mackenzie Delta work we did. So this is the Mackenzie Delta, Inuvik's in here. The two research sites are Havoc Pack Creek and Trail Valley Creek. I'll talk just about Trail Valley today. It's about 60 square kilometers in area. And as I said, mostly tundra, but patches of forest and shrubs. Then I'll talk a bit about the Mackenzie Delta. So Nuvix in this area, this is the active or modern Mackenzie Delta. And it's about 200 kilometers in length and about 60 kilometers in width. And one of the great deltas of the world. So we've been collecting data for the last 20 some odd years in this area. So I won't go into the details here, but weather stations measuring discharge with the help of Water Survey of Canada, um, various snow surveys, various remote sensing types. Um, we're uh, re-establishing a base camp at the area in the next year. So what's, what's been changing this area? So if you look annually at the, the temperature, it's as you would expect. This is some work from Chris Byrne and Steve Coquel since 1920, gradually, you know, fairly stable temperatures and maybe around the 1970s temperatures in the air beginning to warm. If you look at precipitation, now this is just since the mid-1960s, uh, the precipitation has been gradually decreasing. If you look at air temperatures, this is annually, but every season is warming as well, but the winter more than the summer. And if you look at the precipitation, summer and winter precipitation are both decreasing. With a warming climate, you would expect that snowmelt begins earlier in the spring, which it does. So this is from 1960 at Anuvik to 2010. And since 1958, spring melt is starting about 12 days earlier. Since 1985, about when I started working in this area, spring melt's occurring mine, uh, ten, nine days earlier. You know, and even without looking at the data, we know this. We actually used to go up to Anuvik to do our end of winter snow surveys in early May, mid-May, no problem at all. But now we have to go in mid to late April to ensure that we actually catch the end of winter snow cover before it's actually melted at all. So snow melt's beginning earlier. And if you look at the snow depth on the ground, so prefer, before I showed that the precipitation's decreasing, well, precipitation's hard to measure. How about just snow on the ground? So here's all the winter snow depths from Meteorological Service of Canada at Inuvik. The reds are from 1986 to 2012. The blues from 1957 to 1985. So it's pretty clear that the end of winter, this is end of winter, the end of winter snow cover is shallower now on average than it used to be. So our question is hydrologists. We know the temperature is changing, et cetera. You know, in a very general, you know, do we know what the impact is on the water resources? Very general way, I think we did, or we thought we did. But understanding the details, as I said before, is pretty difficult. And I'm going to give you three brief examples. Looking at runoff from spring snowmelt, Mackenzie Delta water levels, and lake, rapid lake disappearance. So, spring snowmelt. This is what we published a number of years ago, you know. Current snowmelt runoff is shown by the blue line. As it gets warmer, you'd expect, and drier, less snowmelt, and you'd expect runoff to occur earlier. It's kind of a no-brainer, right? So we thought. So this is all of the daily um, discharge data from Water Survey of Canada. 
So May and June periods, the period we're going to be looking at where most of the spring, most of the runoff occurs, 62% of the annual runoff occurs during the spring snowmelt, as you would probably expect. So what do we find? Total snowmelt runoff during the spring period is decreasing. So it's down about 10% since 1985. So pretty much as you would expect with lower snowmelt or lower snowfall. If you look at the peak flows during the spring period, they're gradually decreasing as well. So we have lower spring peaks now on average than we used to, but it looks like it's beginning, becoming more variable. You know, three of the highest peaks on record were in the last 10 years, and the lowest peak flow on record was also in that period. So you hear a lot about climate change resulting more variability. Looks like that's what we're, is happening here. But when you look at the timing of stream flow, so Q5 is when 5% of the spring, so the, we're defining that as May and June. So this is when 5% of the May and June discharges occurred, 10% and 50%. So in each case, it's being delayed. So the Q5 is occurring one and a half days later than it used to. The Q10, and Q10 about two days later than it used to. And the Q50 about one and a half days later. So I had a postdoc, John Shi, who was working on this. When he first brought me the data, of course, I went, those water survey guys, they must be getting the data all wrong. Never. <laughs> you know, he eventually convinced me that the data was correct. And there's something very odd going on, because this certainly isn't what any of us would have expected. So as Bill suggested, turns out the system's much more complicated. It's not just warming. The warming is resulting in a land cover change. It's deepening the active layer. So we want to look at what the effects of those are. One of the big changes in this area is shrubification of the tundra. So this is some work with um, Steve Coquel and others. Two air photos, 1972 and 2004. And the black dots are alder shrubs. So Jennifer Balzer is now working with us to try to understand some of these changes. And in the area, since 1972 to 2004, the shrub cover has changed from about 58% to about 74% of the basin area. So the question is, what impact does that have on the hydrology? Um, so this is one of an example shrub patch. And as you'd expect, there's more snow accumulation in the shrubs. So about half a meter of snow on the tundra, one and a half, two meters in the shrub patch itself. So our hypothesis, or one hypothesis that we're looking at, is the Increase in shrubs results in deeper snow stored in these shrub patches, scattered across the landscape. There's less snow in the tundra, of course, then. These shrubs decrease the snow melt rate, hence delaying runoff. The deeper snow also takes longer to melt, of course, so it's also delaying uh, the runoff. And the shrubs are resulting in a deeper active layer underneath them, in most cases anyway, so there's more water storage in these shrub patches all resulting in a delay in runoff. At some time in the future, that will change. And, th and you know, as the shrub cover covers more of the landscape, then there'll probably be a very different change. So we're studying these things through a variety of new instrumentation that we've purchased, uh, help with ecologists and remote sensors to try to really understand what's driving this unexpected change. The next sort of unexpected change, um, we've been looking at water levels in the Mackenzie Delta and the impacts on the aquatic ecology for a number of years, primarily with my colleague Lance Lisak at Simon Fraser University. And the Delta is, is quite a remarkable place if you've never been there. 13,000 square kilometers, some 40,000 lakes covering 50% of the area. And these lakes are perched at various elevations above the main channels of the Delta. So the lower ones are flooded more often and for a longer period of time. The higher ones may be only flooded every few years and for maybe only a few days. Here's one example. This is in the outer Mackenzie Delta, a place called Big Lake. It's probably a billion dollars worth of natural gas underneath this lake. And here's a sequence of uh, photos on four days in 2008. You can see the difference. You know, it's very flat, less than a half a meter above sea level. Very rapid rise, floods the entire area. Um, and then rapidly decreases. So this happens across the delta. So you imagine as the water levels rise in the spring, they flood higher and higher of these lakes. 
But when we actually looked at the data, we saw two very contrasting effects. The lower elevation lakes, the connection time, so how long the lakes were connected, the channels, was increasing due to higher water levels, primarily due to increased storm surges later in the summer on the Beaufort Sea. So decreasing sea ice on the Beaufort Sea results in more storm surges, more flooding, and more flooding of these low elevation lakes. The high elevation lakes, the connection times decreasing, and that's due to reduced ice jam flooding, which is what's controlling flooding um, during the spring melt period. And I like showing this because it shows you you have to be careful what you read in newspapers. These are three articles, all reporting on the one paper on this change in flooding, difference between the, uh, the low elevation lakes and the high elevation lakes. The Globe and Mail reported it as the river delta's rise puts the Arctic's future in flux. The Edmonton Journal said it's drying times for the delta, whereas the News North got it pretty much right, just a time for change. So these are complex processes with different variations in the hydrologic regime, and newspapers obviously have a hard time reporting some of these complex type of issues. The third thing um, I want to quickly talk about is disappearing lakes. A few years ago, there were a number of studies that came out this was one of the first ones looking at disappearing Arctic lakes. So these are lakes, in this case in Siberia, that were found to be rapidly disappearing from the landscape due to melting permafrost. So we went, that's interesting. Lots of lakes east of the Mackenzie Delta. Um, the proposed pipeline was going to go through here. So let's look at some of them. It was clear, and there's certainly been lots of early reports, um, first by J. Ross Mackay, looking at drained lakes. So this is a LIDAR image of this area showing all the lakes and five lakes in sequence that drained at some time in the past. So it's well known that lakes in this area have drained. They drain, drain catastrophically, usually within less than 24 hours. So the question was, are these going to be disappearing? Are the rates of drainage going to increase or decrease with a warming climate? Most other areas show that the lakes are disappearing rapidly from the environment. Here's just a picture of a lake that drained in 2006. So we mapped all of the lakes in this area, all of the lakes that have drained um, over the period 1950 to 2006, and all of the pingos in the area as well, and pingos only form in drained lakes. So lots of lakes, 165 drained in this 11,000 square kilometers over this 50 some odd year period. And then we divided them up, to see how many lakes drained you know, given the sort of timing of the air photos, from 1950 to 73, 74 to 85, 86 to 2000, number of lakes that drained within each of those periods, and the rate of lake drainage per year. So, unexpectedly, we found that the rate of lakes is decreasing. The drainage of lakes is actually decreasing. So that was unexpected. Good news for development in the area, because these would wash out pipelines, wash out roads. So there's fewer flooding events like this. And the reason is related to something like this. So it's, again, it's more complicated than you might think. Uh, J. Ross Mackay in 1988, he outlined a number of the main reasons these lakes rapidly drain. And it's really tunneling through ground ice and especially through ice wedge polygons, which then rapidly melt. Once you get tunnel flow through these ice wedges, they'll melt and rapidly uh, drain the lake. Here's an example of a lake with lake ice wedges all around it that would make it prone to flooding or rapid uh, um, removal. So the question was, maybe it's this change in ice wedge cracking that's actually changing the lake uh, rapid drainage events. So some work we did with uh, uh, Steve Coquel suggests that in this area, ice wedge cracking is actually decreasing it because this is a wintertime process. Ice wedges only crack under extreme cold weather and with changes in s snow cover and warming of the winter, there's actually less ice wedge cracking, hence less um, lake drainage during the early spring period. So again, a very complex series of events to actually describe you know, why these lakes are draining. And it would have been very hard to predict what the, nobody would have predicted what, what, whether the lakes were increasing or de decreasing the rate of drainage. So I'll just stop there, just leave you with this uh, 
figure out of a paper we published a number of years ago looking at a, a variety of the different types of changes you expect to permafrost environments, all which would have big impacts on um, water resources. So I'll just stop there. <laughs>